Welcome to the Writer's Room for Run Radio. I'm Trina Wilcox. My guest today, Mark Anthony Powers. Welcome. Thank you. Nice to be here. So you, I was reading through what your books are about, and then as I was reading, I'm like, boy, that's a lot of research that you're going to have to do. And then I found out why you have the experience. So tell me a little bit about your change in profession and why you know so so much about what you write about. Well, I worked for almost 40 years doing pulmonary and critical care. And so I've, my protagonist specializes in those areas. And so I've lived through a lot of what I, I write. It's, I write fiction, but I have experienced a lot of, of similar situations. And I, you know, I think there are a lot of great writers that write medical thrillers. Um, I don't know. Most of them probably haven't lived through a lot of what they're writing about. They've, they've done good research, but, but um, I think it helps to sometimes to have lived through it. So how long into your career did you, did you always have in the back of the, of your mind that you might write or have you always written just not necessarily the novels based on or what, from what you learned in your career? You know, I, my career kept me so busy that I didn't have a lot of time to think about it. As I was winding my career down, um, I, I was able to stop taking night and weekend call for the last couple of years. Um, and so during those times, I would start to think about, you know, I've got, I've had a lot of experiences. I should start writing some of these things down. Um, I did take a year of creative writing when I was in college and, and, uh, look back on what I wrote and wow, it was pretty, <laughs> pretty raw <rough> stuff. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I decided to take some more classes in writing when, when I retired. And so I immediately took one class after another on, on, then the first one was on writing novels. And so I went ahead and wrote my first novel uh, as, to, as part of that, uh, and then took more classes and, and, uh, and started thinking of other ideas for continuing the the epic that I have written, which is now four books in a series. And uh, and they're the same protagonist, the same characters. Um, it spans about 50 years and uh, hopefully uh, gives a good picture of um, the medical life of my generation. Had you already done a lot of technical writing? Not a lot. Uh, I did a lot more clinical work uh, and um, a lot of my colleagues were writing more academic papers. I wrote several that were published, but um, I can't say it was anything that I concentrated on. I was so busy taking care of sick people that I didn't yeah. didn't think a lot about that. I was mostly also trying to keep up with the medical literature, which is a, a, a major effort in itself. So what surprised you most when you started taking writing classes? Um, well, learning the craft, uh, it's a real craft to try to, to write a, a novel that will keep a reader turning the pages. Uh, you know, you can put down a lot of stuff, but if it's not, if it doesn't catch the reader's attention at the beginning and, and flow in a way that they're happy with and keeps them engaged, you know, have to, you have to constantly be raising the stakes as you write, as the novel goes on to try to keep them wanting to find out what happens. Right. So I think trying to learn to write a good story is is uh, is important, and I, I that's what I try to do with all my all my books. Um, I've also incorporated themes into each of each of them um, that um, are hopefully messages that they'll take from my books. In addition to enjoying a good story, what has changed, if anything, in your writing process from when you started? even having the idea that you would start writing and then you took some classes did did you have a certain system that kind of changed as you learned more or have you just kind of pretty much stuck to a system that's that's a good question i think it's been a real gradual evolution it was um it was i always like to get up in the morning and just get my brain started um, you know, reading the paper and you know, working a few puzzles or something like that, but and then sitting down for a couple hours and, and just with the keyboard and just trying to get something down on paper. I think probably the biggest and most helpful change occurred when I found five other novelists 
and and we and they're all very good writers and we meet regularly i've been meeting with them for five years now and we we're unmerciful with each other and we learn to develop thick skins and i, I don't think you can improve your work unless you have honest feedback mm -hmm. and and that's been incredibly helpful is to have those those people uh, and I'm meeting with them tomorrow again. We're, we're, we're working on my fourth novel now. We're about two thirds of the way through workshopping that. And, and I mean, they look at every word, every line. Um, and so it's been incredibly helpful. I, I don't think I could have completed the books without their encouragement and, 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 and feedback. So uh, committing to a trilogy is a pretty serious commitment. So did you know from the beginning that you were going to have more than one book in a series? No, no, no. no it's actually it's actually four books now, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that'll be that'll complete the series. The four books. Okay. Um, no, I, I wrote the first novel, and and you know I read it through afterwards, and I wasn't really happy with it. I kind of somebody suggested one of my teachers suggested I just put it in the drawer and let it sit there for a while, and really? and uh, and then I had an, an idea for the th the second book which is the which was actually my debut novel and, and it just flowed i mean it just uh, it, it almost wrote itself and that, that's the one a swarm in may uh and there was a lot going on at that time um regarding uh, racism in america and and the, um created a character um you know, my protagonist is white, but in the in that book he had to learn about racism from a black intern that he was supposed to be teaching um, so it was his his learning process and and the uh, and what he learned going through the escalating threats that the black intern faced in the story. Um, that book just wrote itself, and it was actually I, I wrote the first drafts before um, George Floyd was murdered in the U.S. and and the mm. Black Lives Matter really took off uh, here in America. Um, you're in Scotland, right? No, I'm in the U.S. Oh, you are okay. I don't know why I saw Glasgow some, on, somewhere on a, on something, and I was thinking you were overseas. Okay, sorry. No. Um, and then the third book, um, I got the idea for that before the twenty twenty presidential election here, uh, in the, and I um, have been very concerned about climate change, especially since I now have grandsons, and and I mm -hmm. like them to have a. A wonderful world to grow up in, uh, and was watching all that was going on with the elections, and was terrified at how they might come out. Um, and so I wrote the book as though they came out one way, and uh, and it takes a look at climate change and political polarization, and and again that that story kind of wrote itself. Again, it's from the same protagonist's viewpoint, and so he's seeing patients with problems that are caused by climate change. Uh, and he's also living the, the climate change. It's set in 2024, so things are even hotter than they are today. Um, so that was the third book. And, um, I should go back and mention what the first book was because I, I published it between the second and the third. I'd rewritten it, I don't know how many times. Uh, I'd had you know professional editing, I'd cut 50 pages out of it. Um, and finally, my editor said she thought it was ready to publish, and so I did. And that, that that's breath and mercy. And it's um, our protagonist, Phineas Mann, early in his career, starting in medical school, um, when he's facing the ethical dilemmas that physicians face uh, when they're caring for dying patients. And so that was something that you know weighed on me towards the end of my career. And and. I said it in a time before we had the help of palliative care services, and it was a pretty undeveloped area where the physician who was actually at the bedside with the patient was making a lot of those decisions while they're also making decisions about their kidneys and hearts and lungs. Um, so it's, it's written in that time from that perspective. And it took me a while to get where I felt like that one was ready to publish. So it was my second publication. Um, and then the third one was the one about climate. It was called Nature's Bite. And it looks at how even the most powerful people in the world are subject to nature's whims if they uh, don't pay attention to them. 
Uh, now, the fourth book, if you yes, want, yes. If I, if I, as long as I'm on a streak right now, is um, our, our main character, Phineas, is at the a late stage of, of severe Parkinson's disease. His, his mind is still working, but he's experiencing the biases that people generate when they see him and mm -hmm. they think that he's he's doesn't have any worth left and and he's but his mind is working fine and he's got 50 years of pulmonary and critical care expertise in his in his brain and and so he he's called upon to to help and and he has to help some people very close to him um despite everybody's biases about him uh, so it's that's first one the f final one looks at biases specifically ageism and and some other biases. Um, and, and that's that's the final volume of, of the series. It seems like you pretty much know a lot about your subjects before you even write about them. But what do you do when you do hit something that you're not an expert in? How does that research look for you? What's that look like? Do you interview people? Are you on the web? Both, everything. Um, all of that. Plus, yeah. I... I reach out to beta readers. Okay. Um, one of the beta readers for my last novel is a specialist uh, at, at Duke University in Parkinson's disease. And she also runs a narrative writing class at Duke. Um, I, I started take, uh, enjoying her seminars on narrative writing uh, for physicians. Uh, and then when I learned she was a Parkinson's disease specialist, I said, hey, I'm writing a book where the character has that. I said, would you be a beta reader? And she said she'd love to. And so she read the book and gave me some very honest and helpful feedback on it. Um, I have other beta readers, um, Phineas in his, uh, in his state of having the bad Parkinson's disease also has a service dog. I reached out to some people I know who write, who take, who raise service dogs and, and, and are intimately involved with their program to place the dogs with, with patients. And, and he read the, my novel as a beta reader and he gave me feedback on that. And so, um, plus I, I, I get, you know the 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 breadth of knowledge among the, the people that are in my novelist group is is also helpful, and they will often send me references that they come across. And so, um, I think it would be very hard to write in isolation. Uh, and I, yeah. you know, I I have to admire the classic authors back in the eighteen hundreds and nineteen hundreds who wrote timeless fiction all by themselves with a pen and ink. Um, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's mind blowing to think that they could come up with such such gems of, of, of literature so I like that you you have the group I think that's probably something a lot of people listening could you know create is a group of that support and and bounce ideas off of each other if they're not already doing that yeah it's it's been essential I I, I doubt I'd have published one book if I if I hadn't been part of that yeah the, the uh I don't know if where you live they have some something called Ollie uh, O-L-L-I, Osher Lifetime Learning Institute. Um, it's across the, the whole country. I'm not sure it's outside of the U.S., but it might be. But uh, Duke, uh, which is where I retired from, uh, has uh, one of the flagship uh, campuses for Osher Lifetime Learning Institute. And the uh, there are lots of writing classes as part of that. Uh, and that's where I, I took them. And one of the people in one of the classes said, hey, I'm writing a novel. Um, she put a word out on the Ollie website. I'm looking for other people who are writing novels, and our group formed and evolved. So some people left, and now the group that we have right now are all very good writers with incredibly good feedback. So I'm I'm, I'm very lucky. Let's talk about your publishing process. So you've got this group of writers. Did you know from the get go that you would self publish? Did you entertain the idea of sending off manuscripts to publishers, hybrid? Yeah, I did. I, I took a class on self-publishing as part of the uh, Ollie program. And the okay. guy that, that ran it was had self-published a whole series of novels. Um, he'd retired from a teaching career and technical part of at, at Duke. And but he was writing fantasy novels uh, mm -hmm. on the side and so in self-publishing them. And when I took his class, he he in the first cl class uh, classes gave us a picture of what it's like to try to get published with the traditional big publishing houses. 
um, told us what the long odds were of finding a literary agent. Uh, and the odds he gave us, I'm actually seeing even longer odds when I read things now. Um, literary agents uh, are obviously swamped with submissions and, and uh, have to be very quick with their decisions and, and certain, you have to grab them right away. And, and, and one of the things I also learned is that if you're beyond a certain age, the agent may be less uh, excited about taking you on because they want somebody who, that they can work with for a very long career. Um, so when you're when it's your second career, that, that that's going to probably be something against you. Um, so um, when I got A Swarm in May, the second novel, which was my debut novel, ready to where I thought it was the editor thought it was ready to publish and, and I hire a professional editor. OK, that's one of the things I learned in the class is don't publish something that's not edited by somebody who knows what they're doing. Yeah. So I, I hired a professional editor, somebody who is who teaches writing and at the college level and has published multiple novels and nonfiction books. Mm -hmm. And she also will do consulting uh, edit, editors work. And so she sat down with me after she we'd gone through the edits and she said, OK, now let me help you write a query letter so you can get an agent. And I had thought, wow, you know, the, the, the message from a swarm in May is is so urgent. You know, that's the, the whole racism in America picture. It was so urgent. I didn't want to wait five or 10 years to have my book come out. Yeah. And so I said, you know, I think I might explore self-publishing. And she looked at me like I had, you know, two heads and, <laughs> and said, uh, are you sure you really want to do this? And I said, I think so. Let me start exploring it. And so I got out my notes from the class and I realized, wow, this is you really got to know what you're doing technically to, to do this. And I um, emailed my former teacher for that class. And I said, can you, would you mind being a consultant for me? And I'll pay you as a consultant to help me do this. And he said, let me give you a name. I'm too busy. The pandemic is going on and I've got family I've got to care for. I'll give you a name. And he gave me a name and she is the one that did the covers and, and did all the technical part of putting the books on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and Ingram Spark and, and and all the platforms, and was a great help and and gave me the name of somebody who helped me figure out marketing, promotion, and she gave me the name of somebody who would help me do a good website. Uh, so it was just a, a whole series of one people, one person referring me to another person to another, and, uh, and then we got the book ready to go and that's that's very very cool very exciting it seems like you couldn't have if this would have been your first career your writing style would have looked different however do you wish you this would have been your first and only career or do you still are you very grateful for the first one well having the first one behind me has allowed me to write what i've been writing Right. Uh, and it's given me material and ideas. Um, I think I'd have been, I don't think I was ready for this to be my first career. You yeah. know, I, I tried to do this coming out of college or even a graduate school. Maybe if I'd gone and did an MFA or something like that, I'd have had more preparation. But where I was when I entered the medical profession, um, I wouldn't have been ready to, to write maybe play with some short stories, but certainly not tackle a, a novel. Yeah. Uh, and then medical career, particularly specialties I was in, just completely consumed you. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, you know, I did some other things over, while I was doing it, but um, those were just for more for sanity. You know, I took art classes, drawing and sculpting, and I coached Little League Baseball, and I did, you know, things like that just for sanity and, and for my sons. Um, but uh, I, I never would have been able to take two or three hours a day to sit down and, and, and write. Since uh, healthcare is it, part of your world, what is a, a fitness routine and, and taking care of your mental and physical health? What's that look like for your day to day? I, I do try to exercise almost every day. Yeah. If I can, um, 
fortunately, I've been very fortunate. My wife is healthy and she likes to exercise also. And um, I used to run a lot. Um, she convinced me that she wanted me to be able to walk as we got old. And so I, she, we started cycling instead to try to preserve my knees. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and I enjoy swimming. Um, I, when I was 50, I took on the goal of doing a triathlon, a triathlon and, and just to see if I could do it. It wasn't one of the Ironmans. It was a shorter one. Yeah. But I, I, I've always liked to swim. And so I, I, I did that. And then I found out, you know, I really like this kind of training. And so it's, it's come down now to cycling and swimming. Uh, and we hike a lot. We live across the street from uh, an area, a forest that's over 5,000 acres. Oh, and wow. Yeah. Full of trails. And, and she and I have volunteered as stewards to help maintain the trails. And so we hike a lot uh, in that area. We're, we're very fortunate to have found uh, a home near that. That's very exciting. All right. So what's next for you? What's next? Well, I've got to publish this fourth book. Yes. Uh, it's um, right now I'm past 60,000 words on it. Um, my other books are 75 to 85,000. I, I, I'd like to, when I, when I write a book, I, I write what's called a skeleton draft, which yeah. creates the, the, the story arc for me. And then I like to go back over it and over and over and add flesh to the bones uh, and I, I'd like to add a little more flesh to this one. I'm not sure I'll add a whole lot, but um, I, I don't want to add fluff. I don't want to add useless sure. words to it. Um, so I, we're about three or four months from finishing workshopping it in my novelist group. And so during that time, I'm hopefully going to get it where it's ready to send to the editor. All and right. uh, so then there'll be all the, the whole editing process after that. And then the getting it ready to publish uh, process. Uh, that'll be, that's going to take a lot of 2023, I think, uh, right. to get that ready. I, I'm thinking, and this is a, a, my wife's suggestion is I start writing short stories un unless I come up with a, a knockout idea for another novel um, and try to get the short stories in magazines to let people know who I am and maybe they'll want to read my novels. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I want to, I want to learn the, the craft of writing short stories. Or, I've just read a wonderful book by George Saunders uh, called A Swim in a Pond in the Rain, which is a, a, a a workshop. Um, he, he teaches writing short stories and writing fiction in general at Syracuse University. He's a master author, wrote Lincoln and the Bardo and a bunch of other great novels. Um, and I just finished reading that and I think, yeah, I'm going to start trying to study that craft and, and see if I can take that on as a, as a, a new project. I've got a couple ideas for the short stories and, and, and one for a novel, but it's very unformed right now. Sounds like you've got a lot to think about and produce. In the meantime, where can people go to catch up on the reading from you? Great. Uh, yeah, it'd be great if people could read my first three books before the fourth one comes That's out. Right. Um, there are three URLs that will take people to my books. Um, MarkAnthonyPowers.com is the easiest one. If they remember that. My uh, publishing house is called uh, Hawksbill Press as Hawksbill is the uh, endangered sea turtle. Um, so Hawksbill Press, all, all lowercase, all together, dot com, will take them there. And my debut novel, A Swarm in May, dot com, all lowercase again, will also take them to my website, which will give them links to Amazon, Barnes & Noble, um, bookshop.org, which is an uh, Ingram Spark uh, connection. Um, and you can read endorsements from my uh, the people who've, who've written endorsements for the publications uh, at the bar. Um, there are links to those on there uh, and there are blurbs about the each story, each book as, as well as a short bio uh, for me. All right. Thank you so much, Mark Anthony Powers. Come back anytime. Well, thank you for having me. I've enjoyed talking with you. Thanks.